Hey y'all and welcome to this episode. A few notes before we get into the book. So a little while ago, like literally about half an hour ago, I was looking through all of the lists that had all the books that are contributing to the reading challenge. And what I noticed is that um, I had accidentally overlooked uh, four books. So it's not going to be the 42 books challenge anymore. It's going to be the 46 books challenge. Again, this is counting Lord of the Rings as three. And the, where's my sheet? Here's my sheet. <coughs> so the four extra books that are in the challenge now are uh, Scoop, The Big Sleep, Lucky Jim, and um, Abandon the River. So those were on three of the lists. It's... Now the 46 books challenge, so I'm going to update that video, update that playlist, and I will leave a link down below to the playlist. So the book today is uh, Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, and it's one of the first great detective novels, or the first ever detective novels really. So it's got a bit of mystery, a uh, bit of a lot of other things. For the knit part of the lit crit knit, I just made a arm knit scarf. It's <laughs> which is arm knitting is a particular technique where you use your arms as anchors rather than knitting needle or anything and it's already coming apart at the bottom. All right. And so it's usually it works best if you use a bunch of different strands or very thick strands. I used three for this one. You can see it's black and two white strands. And so yeah, it's just a scarf and they knit up fairly quickly. In contrast to the last one, it, this one took me far less time than it took me to read the book, as opposed to Hitchhiker, where I it took me about twice as long to make the thing as it did to read the book. Decided to arm knit mostly because of the time and because there's not a lot of patterns that can easily go along with a uh, woman in white. Into the proper book talk. Uh, the book opens with uh, Walter Hart Wright, who gets a lead on a job from his friend Pesca and Pesca feels all this loyalty to uh, Walter because Walter saved his life one time and remember that name because he disappears on page 22 and does not come up again until page 598 and so the job in question is just teaching he's an artist so he's teaching art to Laura who's around 22 and Marion, who's a couple years older than her. Laura and Marion are half-sisters uh, through their mom. Now they're living with their uncle, with Laura's uncle at um, Limeridge House. Anyway, so Walter and Laura fall in love because apparently that's what you do in novels involving teachers in the, or in the 19th century. But I mean, he's like, he's 28, she's like 21, 22. It's not as creepy than falling in love with your 18 year old tutory slash employee or whatever. Looking at you, Rochester. Oh yeah, also, so Walter meets the woman in white on his way over to Limeridge House because he's apparently walking to London to catch a train in the middle of the night because that's normal for 20-somethings. I do it all the time! So her name is Anne Catherick. Hi, uh, do you know which way it is to London? Um, uh, yeah, it's that way. Great. You're not a baron, are you? Uh, no. Anyway, where are you going? Uh, going to Limeridge. I remember Limeridge. But don't talk to any barons about me, all right? Why? Because of reasons. But... Reasons! Cool. So she's escaped from a mental asylum, and she bears a very striking resemblance to Laura Fairley. Apparently Laura is engaged to Sir Percival Glyde, and there is nothing Walter can do about it. And uh, you would think that Walter being so taken with Laura's eyes and how pretty her eyes are and her eyes, blah, blah, blah. Can you tell she has blue eyes? But does she, does Walter put up a fight? Nope. Marion pretty much forces him to leave, which is kind of depressing. <laughs> but she does help him get a job on an expedition to South America, because that's what people do. <laughs> I mean, honestly, you can flesh this entire first part out and have like a really good novel just right there. But no, this is Wilkie Collins publishing in serial form. So here on page 185, Walter is going off to South America. Laura is about to get married. Marion's kind of just blah, blah, blah. You don't know about Anne because she hasn't shown up for like 80 pages. And then that's the curtain on act one. 
So Act 2 is a whole lot of detail and not a lot of action. So Percival is kind of awful. He's also like 20 or 30 years older than Laura. And he also has this friend Count Fosco. Fosco? I, I can't make sense of Fosco, including with the confessional letter at the end. Like, he bothers me. I mean, to a certain degree he's supposed to bother you, but like... Anne shows up at Laura and Percival's new house and keeps trying to help uh, Laura and Marion find all these this information on Percival Glag because he par apparently has a secret. Secret with a capital S so you know it's for real. Percival keeps trying to get Laura to sign off her inheritance and, and Laura just doesn't and then Fosco does some things and Marion gets her out of it. So Marion does some digging and some listening and some creeping around and some getting sick because she's creeping around in the rain. Um, and she finds out that supposedly Anne is Percival's child and Anne is only a couple years younger than uh, Laura. And also Percival has some financial issues or something. That's partially why he's trying to get Laura's inheritance. And somehow neither of these things are the secret with a capital S. And so Marion and Laura get split up and because to this point it's like been a big deal that they all stay together. Anne gets taken as well and she gets put up in Fosco's house. And then Anne dies, but Fosco has told his staff that Anne is Laura. And so there's a tombstone with Laura's name on it. But the person inside the tomb isn't Laura. And Laura is put away in um, the asylum that Anne had previously been put up in. Marion has to bribe some people to get her out and of course the people at the asylum keep saying like oh yeah of course she's still crazy she keeps going on about like how her name isn't Anne and blah 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 and how she was married and something something Walter right right. And then Walter shows up and he gets back he shows up to the grave to mourn Laura's death and there is Laura like the actual Laura. So Walter spends some time, learns some things, and he finds out that the whole Anne is Percival's kid thing, but no, she's actually not his kid. The capital S secret is that Percival is um, a bastard, like his parents weren't married. Fosco helped him out somehow. Oh yeah, Pesca. Pesca comes back and um, there's some, probably some trope name for this where like Pesca and Fosco are in the same secret society. The generic 18th, 19th century Italian man secret society or something, I don't know. Uh, Pesca, through his clouds within the society, is able to get a confession out of Fosco after Percival has died trying to tamper with some more things and uh yeah it's, and Anne is actually like Laura's half-sister on the other side um but she's dead now too so whatever and at the end it's a little frustrating because Walter and Laura get married as you want them to do apparently. Marion is just like totally chill with being their third wheel for literally the rest of her life which is just like no you're you're smart and stuff. So this was initially published in serial form between 1859 and 1860 and it's one of, again, one of the first detective novels because Sherlock Holmes didn't come out for another about 30 years after and Marion and Walter are kind of... I like them. Like, I like them as individuals but I do wish you could have seen them more as a unit because you don't really see them bouncing ideas off each other. It's more of like, you, you look after Laura, I'll do the sleuthing. Or, what the sleu sleuthing have you been doing? I've been in South America. For what year is it again? I did get a little frustrated with this. Laura is the kind of person who probably needs to get looked after a lot. I am a little frustrated with motives. I mean, maybe it's partly because I'm, I had to read it over the course of a month instead of like the course of a week. Fosco, you don't get motives for Fosco at all. The person with the strongest motives is Pe is Pesca, just because like, you know, flat out, like he nearly drowned and Walter saved him and that's why he's so loyal to Walter. Marion and Walter just seems to be motivated by don't let Laura have too much shit happen to her. I understand that, but also why isn't Laura as careful about her own life as Marion and Walter are. Alright, if the shot looks different I had to change my sim card 
Anyway, maybe just being a bastard was a much bigger deal in the 1850s. Again, there was inheritance laws and it's a novel driven by events. Like there's a couple chapters that leave off with like a... That being said, some of the twists really are good. If you want to read it, spend a good chunk of time every day. Like I had to read it over the course of the month. I read about the first half in a week or 10 days or so. I was like getting angry at this book. I was getting surprised by this book during that week. And then life happened and other things and I had to sort of slow down my reading a bit. If you can read over the course, you know, a week or two, try and do that because then this book will feel really good. But if you can, only commit to a little while every day or and you can't like get through it in a reasonable amount of time you're not gonna get a lot of out of it. I feel like I would have liked it more had I been able to continue on that like trajectory from that first 300 pages like into the next 300 pages and I was talking to a co-worker about this as well and it's kind of a thing that Wilkie Collins does is that he'll have you slog through the middle bits but then the ending makes it worth it. The middle bits are like, oh yeah, my pen was in a slightly different area. Maybe Fosco sent out a weird letter or maybe he didn't. I don't really know. But if you like mysteries and you like the sort of first ever detective novel, probably check this out. Thanks for watching y'all. I'll see y'all in the next one, which uh, should be up fairly soon because in contrast to Woman in White, I read Madame Bovary in like a week. But yeah, the next one is Madame Bovary, uh, and that'll be up whenever I'm done filming and editing it. But thanks for watching. I will see y'all in the next one. Bye!